Here it comes, the return of the great American dream machine. Here are highlights from the 1971-72 award-winning series of The Great American Dream Machine. Some folks I lift my cup to It ain't true that only midgets Have somebody to look up to And when I find someone with guts Who's got a dream that's kinda nuts I don't care if his IQ is next to zero I just stick out my right hand And say I'm proud to meet a man Who we all can call a great American hero People always ask me, Big Daddy, where do you get all those strange ideas? And I tell them, well, I watch television a lot. One night I was watching Dr. Frankenstein, <laughs> and I get this wild idea for a car called the Druid Princess. See that thousand pound car there? It's wild, ain't it? And look at that chrome plated engine. And look at that little casket back there. You know what that's for? <laughs> hey, move on over. That big daddy true. I was only 14 when I built my first rod. I had a four-barrel holly and a chrome dual quad. I did what I could with the parts off the shelf, but soon I got so good that I could do it myself. Bad, bad, big daddy. Bad, bad, big daddy. Bad, bad, big daddy. I took a gas-eating mother that was quite a disgrace, and then I chopped and I channeled all over the place. I bored her and stroked her and lowered her down, and soon I had me the fattest set of wheels in town. And that's the truth, Ralph Nader. <laughs> I've been to Detroit and talked to the big shots, and I've gone down and talked to friends of mine that have uh, started painting weirdo shirts and uh, graduated into the Detroit styling thing. They all tell me the same thing, man. Their uh, their martinis are being drunken in there, and uh, the, the the big shot designer comes in and s s uh, stamps his foot a little bit and. Uh, uh, raises a little cane and uh, they all go home and have more martinis. You know, it's a sort of a big orgy time in Detroit. Big Daddy Will, you're so bad. When you're high on the hall, are you driving me mad? Big Daddy Will, you're so weird. With the stars in your eyes and the bugs in your beard. Oh. Uh, the guys that work in Detroit, they're kissies anyway. I mean, they really uh, have nothing going for them. All they got going for them is how to conduct themselves like gentlemen at these board meetings. And that's not where it's at. They got to get in there and use the machine. When uh, Big Daddy says that the designer in Detroit is not uh, too involved, doesn't want to get his hands dirty, I don't believe that's true. I think we get our hands dirty kind of in a different way. He does it perhaps in his shop, 
We do it on our drawing board and we do it in our clay modeling right here on the scene, working constantly, revising, uh, adding, uh, taking into account uh, federal requirements, taking into account uh, ecology in general, taking into account uh, corporate philosophy. See, I was the young kid that was going to show Detroit how to build a car. The rest of the cars were getting gigantic, but I wanted something small like the Volkswagen, and something that was had a lot of power, would really go, would wail. And this was to be the hot rod of the 1950s. Built the road agent about 63. This was the real step away from the hot rod. It was no longer a toy. This was actually dream stuff that I was trying to impress Detroit with or impress people with that could be built. It was very small. It's only eight feet long. 1965, I, I decided to build a car that would show the surfing trend that was going on in California. So Dirty Doug and myself started on this thousand pound four cylinder motored surfite and it was made to negotiate any kind of beach or terrain or anything. Big Daddy Roth seems to have achieved a remarkable synthesis of variations on a mechanistic folk theme using contemporary artifacts. I don't think of myself as an artist, I think of myself as a hard worker. He reflects in his own inimitable way the dynamic quality of contemporary youth culture and all its panoply of cult objects. So hip, so cool, so right on, so, so rank, so vile, so exquisitely repulsive. His influence, uh, as far as design is concerned, I'm sure has an effect on the group out in California. But as far as what he has done as a designer and his influence on the domestic scene, I don't believe there is an immediate tie. I think his group is a very select group and one who is interested primarily in customizing automobiles as opposed to uh, the kind of designing that I believe we do. And that's one of uh, quality, function, uh, style, sleekness quietness and all of the, uh, the cliches that I think that are wrapped up, up and around the market that the people are interested in here on uh, the normal type transportation vehicle. This is what I'm really into. A big moving mother called the California Cruiser. I mean, this baby moves 140, 150 miles an hour. Chrysler is not going to come out with a chopper. You turn me down, and then turn right around, and put fins on the Chevys and Caddies. Why you even change the grill, and what still makes me ill, is the changes all were Big Daddies. Whoa, I was the one to put fins on the tail. I made it work, but Detroit, you made it fail. I was the I think the great American dream machine is cars. The ideal car would have like, like two wheels and a seat and handlebars.
One that runs all the time with no problems. That's my ideal car. With no gas. <laughs> I wish you would take all the cars out of the streets. I don't know. I don't really think there could be an ideal American car. Oh, Lord, cars. To me, are just uh, pieces of material things. As long as it gets you there, I don't really care what the inside is like. Uh, the way Mr. Nader works, you know, safe, practical, economical, and American-made. <laughs> Safe. I think that the automobile people, because of American, uh, the American public itself, has put too much stress on beauty and speed when they could have put all this, all this money and all this energy into making cars very safe and completely non-polluted. I got a black Volkswagen with a sign in the window that says, do we really all look alike? Let's play him. The ideal car. I guess a Stutz Barricade I'd like. <laughs> Probably a Mercedes-Benz convertible. <laughs> Best car would be the Citroën. A Bentley. I guess an Opel GT. A Mach 1 Mustang. Ferrari. Ford, I think. Ford. Very possibly a Saab. Well, if I could afford the insurance, I'd like to drive a Corvette. If I had a million dollars, I would have me El Torado. A Fleetwood Cadillac. Cadillac.
is an ancient legend that tells the old story that when an automobile is dying, it goes to a special burial ground. There it expires and deposits its treasures and special precious ivories. You can see these cemeteries on the outskirts of towns, surrounding them, dotting the landscape, enshrouded by somber yet business-like gates. I think there is one near here. Come, let me be your Virgil and I will guide you to this mechanical hell. Trash, thistles and nettles and cockleburrs. This is a dangerous undertaking, full of perils and pitfalls, but I feel equal to the task. A clue. I knew it was here somewhere. When a car is dying, the other cars will help it along to the sacred ground and stay with it till it's over. <coughs> Very touching. <coughs> this is it. Abandon all horsepower, ye who enter here. Oh, poor, sad garden of twisted metal flowers and broken bodies. To paraphrase Ozymandias, look on these works, ye mighty, and despair. Ah, the river sticks. <laughs> McLuhan says, the more commonplace a thing is in its own time, the more rare it will be in later centuries. For the Greeks and Romans, the rare items have turned out to be the rudest and poorest of clay pots. For our culture, it will be these four, five, and six thousand dollar items. This is planned obsolescence and how it really works, right down here at the end of the line. The high livers go out the fastest. The pony cars, the muscle cars, the full of ginger and spunk cars. And when they break, all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put their 427 cubic inches back together again. They don't make them like this anymore. In a recent four-year period, over 24 million cars were scrapped. However, lest any of you fear that Automobilis Americanus is rapidly becoming extinct, let me hasten to reassure you that in that same period of 1966 to 69, over 33 million new cars entered this world. <laughs> Where will it all end? Will we be inundated with scrapped cars? Will Detroit finally perfect the Kleenex car that we drive once around the block and then discard? If these cars were designed better to last longer, and if people really cared for them, could we hold down this spreading blight? And if some part in a car is no good, is that any reason at all to throw away the whole expensive machine? And what about reclamation and recycling? I'm sorry, little car. I have my heart set on a new model.
Tonight, I'd like to say a few words on behalf of politicians. It isn't going to be easy, but maybe we've been too rough on them. When you call someone a politician, it's a rotten thing to say about him. There's just nothing good or honorable about the word, the way we use it. Look at the way we treat some of these great leaders of ours. We poke fun at what they look like. We act as though they were paid entertainers performing on a stage for us. We're all critics sitting down front, waiting for them to say something wonderful that'll save the country. Every once in a while, just to give them enough encouragement to keep going, we applaud them a little. 
We've tried to figure out why politicians are held in such low esteem by the rest of us, and we've come to a few general conclusions. First, take a look at the whole political process. A man among us who is naturally constructive and optimistic about improving the way we live decides to devote his life to politics. He has noble ambitions. He's going to do something for his fellow man. He's going to run for office. That I announce my intention to seek with all possible vigor and determination the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States. Now, the first thing he's got to do, if he's going to get us to vote for him, is let us know who he is. Right away, he irritates us. Instinctively, we distrust anyone who tells us a lot about himself. I have worked hard to earn my way in both public and private life. It's difficult for even a modest and graceful man to appear modest and graceful as a politician. The people of my district elected me to end the war in Indochina. And there's another reason why we're suspicious of politicians, too. If a man wants to help, he knows he first has to get elected. To do that, he has to gain the confidence of a lot of people, each one of whom probably believes something different. Now, with people believing different things, naturally, he can't always tell one audience what he told the last. That's what I said. The greatest union of all is the American Union. Communism is a threat to every free man. We are literally in the temple of divine providence. Sometimes a politician travels so much he can't remember what city he's in, let alone what everyone's name there is. George Schley and Byron Rumford and Bob Cross. Bob Crown, Dick Bob Pet Crown, Nick Petrus, Nick Petrus Mark <laughs> they're all old friends. <laughs> We're one people in Illinois. The good politician doesn't actually lie, though. He uses devices that are cousins to the lie. He's evasive. I think it remains to be seen. I don't think it's wise that I comment on that uh, while I'm still in uniform, so I'll just say no comment. Would you say that it's an escalation of the air war? I wouldn't want to say anything. Whether this means I'll run for president, I do not know. He's silent. Well, step He's up. ambiguous. It's negotiations. And if you're going to negotiate, my experience domestically and foreign-wise has always been that you have to prepare and give and take. Well, I've said two things consistently. One, I didn't think there was such a thing as a draft. And two, that uh, when pressed, I said I would face a draft uh, when it came. In their efforts to appeal to special interest groups, politicians subject themselves to a variety of indignities. This may endear them to a small number of those specially interested, but it makes them look silly to the rest of us watching on television. To say something needs changing is one thing. But once a politician is elected, he has to decide exactly what has to be changed and how. That's a lot harder. Uh, I'm not going to announce now the decision that I will make. Uh, I cannot promise, and I would not want to hold out, uh, any false hope. This is a problem that is not a problem for government. We cannot solve it. The necessity for deciding what he really thinks about something and then doing something about it makes a politician unique. Most of us live our whole lives without deciding what it is we really believe in. We ad lib our way through each situation as it arises. If we do have strong opinions, we keep them to ourselves where it might hurt us socially or economically to say anything about them. Faced with tough decisions, we don't make them. We lie in the sun or have a drink or decide to go to bed and think it over. And finally, we put it off until it's too late to make any decision at all. A politician can't do that. He has no place to hide. Whether he decides to declare war or raise taxes, he has to do it out in the open where everyone can see him. Even in the privacy of his office, a politician has no privacy. Who among us works so well and conscientiously that he would willingly submit his day's work to this kind of scrutiny? He can't even go out and play with the other fellows without being watched. His political enemies are always ready to jump on him. 
Lindsay could never be elected on his own. Impossible. I say that Adlai III has demeaned his great name. By any fair test, uh, he's the number one radical in the country. Then it's fair to say that you would he's welcome... He's badgered by the press. As a matter of fact, if he were a criminal and the press were the police, the Civil Liberties Union would come to his defense. What do you think of the Nixon role? That's straddling an issue. Is there enough support? Senator, do you have any magical powers that you may invoke? How did you react, Senator, if you don't mind, 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 mind? People don't inspect the work of their God as closely as they inspect the work of their politicians. And then we don't expect them to suffer from any of our mortal shortcomings either. We expect him to be more honest than we are honest. But then we expect him to go to church, even though he may not be a churchgoer. His table manners must stand up under the magnification of a close-up shot. He has to eat when he isn't hungry and go hungry when he'd like something to eat. A politician's wife must be an ever-smiling little helpmate, a tireless worker for good things. Although she ought never express an opinion on anything of any more political significance than beauty or the Boy Scouts. A politician's children are expected to be the living models of a model young American. We demand a perfection in them we wouldn't dream of expecting in our own children. There simply is no doubt about it. The politician is the most maligned, over-criticized, underpaid individual in our society, and we wouldn't have a society without him. It's a wonder we can get anyone to take the job, let alone fight over trying to get it. Power keeps settling into the hands of a few able men. It happens because the rest of us are either incompetent or too lazy to govern even our own lives, let alone the lives of others. We dislike the men with power because on the one hand, we want to be relieved of all the responsibility of government. But on the other hand, we resent anyone who has the power to reduce our freedom, even to the extent of telling us which night to put the garbage out. We live in constant fear of being dictated to but we enjoy the comfort of living under the firm hand of an authoritarian leader. We're content to let him lead us, just as long as we can occasionally yell at him one of the dirtiest words of all, politician. I want to state as firmly as I can that this picture is distorted, stupid, and absolutely wrong. <laughs> I guess in, in dusting and spraying than, than you do in most professions because it it kind of uh, invites you know that kind of personality. Sometimes you'll just be around the hangar working or something and the farmer will just drive up and say uh, can you spray this afternoon? That bolt's going to have to come out and go back through the other way. Yeah. The organic phosphates, methyl parathionate made from the same uh, base as nerve gas. As a matter of fact, that's where it came from, from World War II nerve gas. Well, you should have rubber gloves on and protective clothing and stuff like that when you're handling these chemicals. I was sick about uh, two weeks ago, and it was totally my fault. I got a pretty heavy exposure to it. I was cleaning out a hopper. I was exposed pretty heavily to the to it in the concentration that we put it on the field. 
which is pretty strong. And you get headaches and your vision gets blurred, sometimes fever and all that sort of thing. I think just about everybody that flies around trees and wires has hit limbs and maybe cut a, cut wires or run into trees or something like that. If, they, if you've never cut a wire or run into a limb and they fly around them, then they're not getting close enough. We have flagmen that stand under it all day long, right in the mist in the, where, where it's being applied and don't, doesn't seem to bother them. Most of them now will move out of the way. In other words, they'll let you line up on your swath and then they will walk out of the way before you get to them. Of course, there is a lot of concern now about pesticides affecting the ecology. And I don't think that uh, anti-pollution uh, causes is going to cut down our spray because I, th I, th I feel certain that, that uh, they'll come up with acceptable substitutes if the pesticides we're using now are banned. Once they start getting insect infestations, then it usually they start on a little spray program where they'll spray every uh, few days, usually about five days between sprays. You'll have some insects that are resistant to the spray that'll be left over. And within just a few days, you'll have another population. So maybe in one season, you'll spray the same field 13, 14 times. I think all pilots get some kind of uh, enjoyment flying close to the ground and in and out of, of fields with obstacles and that sort of thing. It's a, it's a unique feeling. Knowing that, that if you do make a mistake that there is a certain amount of danger in it, of course keeps it interesting and keeps you from getting too bored with it. Pesticides are, uh, by nature of, you know, of their job, they are toxic. Of course, there are some drawbacks to, uh, to using the pesticides that we have to use, but that uh, the benefit we get from them outweighs it. In other words, it's by, uh, the use of the pesticides is the lesser of two evils. The way I look at ag farming, at crop dusting, is a, you know, it's, I, do, I do it because I enjoy doing it. And uh, some, I, I think somewhere down in Central America. I'd like to fly with a good mechanic, a good loader. And make maybe 50 cents an acre for as pilot pay and have a a house on the beach and all that sort of thing.
up! You've got to get up! You've got to get up! <laughs> He just ran over a snake. I have never seen so many animals. It's the way you drive. You know, I'm a good driver. You're a good driver. I am a driver. very. Oh, you're an impossible driver. Why? Because I killed a few rabbits. Slow down, will you? Slow down. You're ruining my reputation. Slow down. Slow. I can't keep up with you. You're winning. You're winning. You know what you're doing? You're overpopulating the world. I want more war, more famine, more poverty, more starvation, more death. People dying from famine, poverty. Oh, sure, be happy. Keep on singing. Not listening to you. I'm making people and animals and Have you ever heard of birth control? Birth control. You know what's going to happen? 50 to 100 years from now. You'll have to have a license to have a baby. Stop your practicing uh -huh. for a minute. We might qualify. It's easier to get a license for a dog, Mother. Let's go down, please. Mother, Mother, I told what? you a hundred times. I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm a violinist. Oh, Harvey, now they want culturally oriented. We're... Mother, now... not, not, not again. We've done it ten times before. You can pass the test. You are a magnificent violinist. You're the world loves you. Let's go down to the sperm bank now, Mother, please. That... All right, let's go to the sperm bank. Let's go to the ovum bank. Oh. Uh, then maybe We're if I play out. something nice on the violin. such a thing and they will only have one birth a year you will have no deaths they will live forever my dear death darling <laughs> today I am 225 years of age show I'll drink a toast to myself. I remember my first transplant. I was around 50, 52 years old. Somewhere around there. Is it my right or my left kidney? Uh, here's to my original kidney. That reminds me of the time I was 100 years old. I didn't know who I was. An identity crisis. I had Mabel's left ventricle. I had Ferguson's right ventricle. And then the most important one of all, 
A brand new, young, unused pelvic region. Cost me a fortune. But it was worth it. You'll be extinct. You'll be forgotten. How can I put up with you? You're pushing me. Now don't push me to the brink. You're going too far. I'll do it. I've got my finger on it. You'll make me do it. Oh, You'll make stop me do it. it. You're, you're pushing me. Don't push me. Don't push me too hard. I will push you as much as I oh, want. Oh, no, you don't. Go ahead, no, kill don't. me. Oh, kill me. Do kill you. whatever you want. I push do. the button. We're, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. It's the chief. Stop fighting. Muda. Muda. Take steps. Give up war games. It won't good. Evolve. Muda. Evolve. 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 Global school summer. You
Does anyone know who said death is nature's way of telling you to slow down? I want to go simply when I go. Skiddly do wah, skiddly do wah. They'll give me a simple funeral there, I know. Whoa, whoa. With a casket lined in fleece. Ah, uh, and fireworks spelling out rest in peace. Oh, take me when I'm gone to forest law. Do wah, do wah, do wah. 